probably the one that, that touches us most deeply. Nice ideas. What does it really have to say? Why does it matter? Why do we need to start looking at God in this way if we want to see how we can believe in a God? Well, I think it's a very relevant question, and as I've been really looking through some of the um, pre-questions pre that came in, you know, for everywhere from Atlanta to Loganville to Brazelton, Georgia, to Seagrove, Grove, Florida, even across to Surrey, England, I got questions about how do you how do you get through, how do you understand, how do you respond to the loss of health, the loss of a job, the loss of a home, the loss of an inheritance, the loss of a loved one. If you've struggled through something like this, you know it causes you to ask deep questions, why? And how can I look to a God when I'm going through such tough, such tough times? For me, I had to learn in college a little bit of how to pray more effectively. What struck me um, was that I had to go back to God each time. And I had a real reason to. I'd been told when I was in high school that I had inherited bipolar disorder. Now, this was uh, something that had just tremendous emotional instability. And it had wreaked havoc on one whole side of my family. Uh, and just the experience of alcoholism and even suicide was just really devastating. I was told this was incurable, something I was going to have to deal with my whole life. I was told that there were medications that might be able to ameliorate some of these symptoms, but I was never going to be cured, and many of the side effects were quite, quite difficult. Well, I figured that was incurable, so that went on the back burner, but I went on to college and I had begun uh, a deep questioning of what was going on. The first thing I began to do is really get a deeper sense of what life was all about. You know, I was just trying to find a reason to get out of bed. So, you know, I read widely, and I read some Eastern uh, religion. There were some ideas in there, but they, they weren't really resonating with both my head and my heart. Then I read some philosophy, a little bit of Albert Camus, and uh, existentialism, and boy, that was not a reason to get out of bed in the morning. But I wasn't particularly picky. I read advice columns, I read classic novels, modern novels, and I was just trying to find someone who could tell me what this was all about. Well, I went back to the Bible because I lived in a family with two different Christian churches that I was going back and forth between. So the Bible was very familiar to me. Sometimes I'd open it up and find something that quite inspiring, and sometimes I'd find ideas in it that just I couldn't relate to. God seemed so hard to know. And so it was actually in going to this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, that Mary Baker Eddy had written, that I began to get a deeper sense of what I was reading in the Bible and seeing the continuity of what God is. And it was in doing this that I really appreciated on the very first page her saying, the time for thinkers has come. Because I didn't want to be told about God. I had heard plenty of things. I wanted to think my way through it. And I began to find in the first chapter on prayer ideas that were really revolutionary. This idea that prayer was not changing an unchanging God, no matter how much I petitioned, no matter how much I repeated, I was never going to change unchanging love. So what was changing, as we could see, was me. I was changing. And I love some of the ideas in it. Prayer cannot change the science of being, but it tends to bring us into harmony with it. Wow. Prayer was changing me. So I began to apply some of these ideas to the experiences I was having in college, one of which was my freshman fall. I don't know what it was, but I went to school in New England, and it seemed like every exam period, the whole campus would get the flu. And that seemed to be my case, and I was sitting at the dinner table with my, one of my roommates, and she had, and I were both commiserating about these symptoms. She went off to the biology library to study for her exam. I went to the main campus library to study for my German exam. But you know what? I felt so lousy, I just couldn't do it. And I began to um, think, well, I've been studying these ideas in Christian science about God. 
And it occurred to me to think about God in a new way. And I thought, well, I've been learning that God is mind, source of all intelligence. Boy, I sure need intelligence on these exams. And I thought, God is infinite mind. Can that mind be congested? Can it ache? Can it feel foggy? I mean, the thought of it was so absurd to me that I almost started laughing, and I thought, wow, God is completely free of all this. And then I went back to an idea from the Bible, from Genesis 1, that we are made in the image and likeness of God. And I began to think, wow, if God is untroubled by this, then I, as the image and likeness, can't be troubled by it either. It seems such a natural conclusion that I just went back to my work and I looked up about 15 minutes later and all the symptoms had ceased, just gone. Now, it's natural to feel normal and healthy, so I didn't really think much about it. But towards the end of the week, I ran into my friend again. We had been on opposite exam schedules. She was still miserable, still suffering from all the symptoms. She had tried over-the-counter remedies, but nothing had changed. And, you know, my heart went out to her. She was a wonderful person. She was suffering so. And I, I said, oh, I'm so sorry to see you feeling that. She said, well, what, what happened to you? You and I were feeling the same way. So I told her I had prayed, and all the symptoms had ended. Well, that was a little revolutionary for her. She didn't think prayer could do anything tangible in our experience. In fact, she didn't have much use for religion in general. Her parents had come from two different faith traditions, and when they married, their families turned their back on her parents. So she had learned to live with a sense that love was unpredictable, that life was just happenstance. She didn't understand that by going back to a broader sense of what God is, it connects to all the things that we're dealing with. And it connects in a way that all of us can appeal to, turn to, rely on, because a principle is universal. It's inclusive. No one is left out. Well, I began to find that prayer was natural. It had both reasoning in it, but it had a spiritual sense and an inspiration and insight, that touch of the light of the Christ, illuminating for me a new way of thinking about things. Healing was a natural way of rediscovering what was always part of my life. And I began to find this not just with the flu, but with injuries from when I played rugby, with... Uh, uh, eating disorder that I struggled through with my exams, with relationships, I found that by going back to God, I was going back to the source of all good, and I was finding how that was embracing the whole of my life. Well, during this time, I really began to find a shift in my thinking, and all those symptoms of bipolar just evaporated, just like mist on a, on a sunny morning. It was so extraordinary to find such tangible sense of my life being free of these terrible conditions, these inherited problems, that it really deepened my sense of going to Christian science, that wonderful sense of going back to what God is as the source of answers for everything in my life. It was a wonderful way to raise our children. It began a real deep commitment to Christian science that ended up with me becoming a Christian science practitioner so that I was able for anyone in the community to come and ask me to pray with and for them and help them feel themselves turning back to God, finding the light of Christ illuminating for them everything they thought they had lost. Well, that's on in an individual level, but sometimes people ask me, well, what about the injustices that happen to communities, like disasters? Well, I had an experience several years ago that really helped me understand that, again, prayer and going back to God as the source of all good is what we need to, when we're facing those sense of, of collective disasters that, that touch the innocent and, and the, the sinner alike, those who are living uh, very separate lives from good and from truth and from love. It was the uh, experience of Hurricane Katrina. We were up here in, in uh, Massachusetts, but we were so um, touched by the headlines we were seeing on the news of what was going on down there. And uh, maybe you all don't remember, but at the time, it was just the people who were there with this 
storm coming through and the devastation being unlike anything anyone had seen in a hundred years. Well, the government was not the first ones in. It was really the news reporters and the first responders were actually the Salvation Army, um, consecrated true believers in God's goodness. And one of the reporters was so angry by what she saw, so frustrated by this picture of suffering, she took her, her microphone and went up to one of the first responders and said to him, why did God make this happen? And he, with all equanimity, responded with this gentle sense, God was not in the storm. God is in the response to it. And that really resonated with my husband and me. And as we prayed about how we could support that situation, we found ourselves and our children and a friend of the family going down to do relief work down there. God is in the response to it. As we turn to God and let the Christ light illumine, what is there? What is there? Love is there. We went down and we found amazing examples of seeing God's goodness right in the middle of this with a small band of church members, a tiny little church that had been destroyed by the flood. We went down to help do some salvage work for them, and we were absolutely touched by their sense that good was going on, that there were things to be grateful for, that they were connecting with resources and sharing those resources with their neighbors, with the first responders who were there. We've been so impressed that even in the middle of the devastation that seems to come across our life, much of what, which, by the way, was attributed to human mistakes and corruption, that right there, the response to it can draw from the infinite resources of God's love and life and spirit. That even community events can call us to a sense of prayer that is effective, tangible, and makes a difference. Within two years, that little church, by the way, it's just a handful of members, several of whom had lost their own homes. Within two years, they had rebuilt that church. It was one of the first buildings in the community that was completely brought new. It was an inspiration for everyone there. And as they did, they began to um, you know, share all this sense of renewal with their neighbors. Now, in that two-year period, uh, at that point, our son went down to do more relief work with some very well-known organizations. And when I came back, I said, so, you know, are you seeing all the, the rehabbing of these um, communities? And, and are you seeing these great changes and restoration? And he said, no, Mom. Where I was, there was no expectation of change. No one was praying. I thought that was an extraordinary comment for a teenager to recognize that what he saw with the church group that was rebuilding, restoring, began with prayer, and a prayer that knew God's goodness was universal, inclusive, and impartial. You know, finding a God we can believe in, it's going to be an individual journey. It's going to resonate within our own hearts.